YouTube, what is good? So last week I did a video where I critiqued your street photography, and we're still going to do an episode two and an episode three of that video, probably next week and the following week. But this week, we're going to switch it up, and I'm going to critique my own photography from 2014, so about six years ago, and I'm going to explain why, looking back on these photos now, they're not very good. But an important note before we get into this video today, saying my old photos are not very good is based on my opinion of my photography. Now, at the time, they might have been great, and you might be watching this video thinking, yo, I wish my photography looked like that, and that is completely fine. You see, the great thing about photography, my favorite thing about this in general, is that you're never done. You can always get better, always improve. You never want to stay too static. So if I was looking at these photos from 2014 and they looked exactly like my photography now, that'd be a huge problem. It means I wouldn't be progressing, I wouldn't be learning, and I probably would have quit photography at this point because... Like, why would you want to do the exact same thing for six years? So today I'm breaking it down. This is going to be a big lesson in composition because that's the major problem with most of these old photos. They're just, they're composition disasters, essentially. And not to mention they are over-editing disasters, but we're not even going to talk about that. This is how I used to edit my photos. It's terrible. You see, it's like when you look at a picture of your mom and dad and they're wearing some ridiculous outfit from 1950 and you're like, dude, why did you dress like that? That, that was me editing those photos. It was kind of trendy. It was what was popular at the time. And looking back on it, I'm like, dude, why did you dress your pictures like that? So we're not even going to talk about the edits. The edits are terrible. The editing I do now is way more minimal. I like it a lot better. But let's talk about these compositions. Let's get into it. I have a bunch of examples today. So our first photo is this cityscape right here. Composition 101. Look at this. There's so much negative space on the left side, the right side, and the middle of the image. It's a gray, cloudy day. Way too much negative space, especially in the middle of the photo. This is something I call double subjecting, where you put two subjects on each side of the image and then nothing in the middle. And when you look at it, your brain is like, what am I even supposed to look at here? Next one. Oh, classic fence photo. We all have made images like this before. Problem with this photo, what is the subject? There is nothing going on. It's just this drab city behind this fence. Yeah, it I guess looks kind of cool. Maybe once again as part of a set of photos, but standalone by itself, like what am I looking at? There's there's no subject to this picture at all. Before we get going on any more of these, I probably should mention the fact that all these are on a Twitter thread that I have right now. If you go to my Twitter, at Evan Ramped, at the top of my tweets and everything, I pinned it up there so you can go there and you can see a breakdown of how my photography has changed from 2014 all the way to now. I think at the time this video will be out, I'll be posting 2018 probably, maybe 2019, not exactly sure, but go check it out and do me a solid, hit the thumbs up on this video while I'm chatting with you. So example number three, we got this person going down this escalator. I like how there's an isolated subject here. The problem, you see these lights, they're a lead line pointing you down the middle of the tunnel. You have two lines pointing you towards something. And I put the subject on the right side of the image as opposed to towards where the lead lines are pointing them. So when you look at this visually, your eye is following following these two lines to this center. I marked it with an X. What am I looking at? There's nothing there. Instead, the subject is off to the right. Not necessarily bad here, um, but the composition is just sending your eyeballs in one direction, and then you have to come back and find this other piece of the photo. It's just not balanced. Next up, another cityscape. Once again, the same problem as the last cityscape. Uh, there's just way too much negative space going on here. I probably could have punched in on the crop, probably could have used a zoom lens or something like that. Our sky is very boring, very plain, just a blue night sky, and then we have have this disgusting building in the bottom left of the image. I don't know what's going on here. That building is like so hideous. It completely ruins this photo. Really to fix this thing, all you have to do is punch in with a different lens, bypass that building on the left, and then you could even have that blue sky, just not as much of it. In this composition, it's just way too much negative space in the top right of the photo. We got this bridge photo, the bridge with the X's. This actually isn't too bad. It's pretty cool, but it's very one-dimensional. So if you follow this thread on Twitter, I mentioned how a lot of these photos are one-dimensional. What that means is there's just one thing going on. You look at the photo and say, okay, I understand that right away. This is just one thing happening here. It's a bridge that looks cool. So something I could have done to improve this is maybe have something happening inside of this, you know, arrow pointing composition that's leading you down this hallway, whether it's a person, whether it's someone walking with a suitcase, whether it's even someone like sitting on the ground, even something happening on the ground, just anything else going on this photo to add another layer of interest would benefit it. Next up, we got this photo of two people walking with this tree with the light 
light casting some good shadows. This actually isn't that bad. I'm not gonna lie, for a photo that is six years old, this is probably the best one of this set. We got some lead lines pointing you towards the center of the image, be it the buildings on both sides. We have this tree thing in the middle. I don't know if I necessarily like how it's cutting the scene, but because of the composition, it's kind of cool how the tree is cutting it down the middle with the shadow, and then you have sort of mirroring images on both sides because you have the buildings with the lead lines and then the two people walking. Uh, I don't think this image would have worked as well if there was only one person walking on either side but I think because there's two people and then kind of the mirroring compositions and then the tree in the middle with the good light and then the shadows not too bad there's a lot more going on in this photo when you compare this to the last one this has so many more elements compared to just the basic bridge photo you can stare at this a lot longer and try to figure out what exactly is going on because there's a lot more layers next up we have this photo from I think I was on a cattle ranch that a friend invited me to um, I was driving home and we have this road shot with this blue sky. Notice how in this photo the sky isn't just a plain blue. There's some depth to it. There's like the clouds and everything and it's just after blue hour. This is a much more interesting sky than just a plain blue night or a plain overcast day. And as you can see the road is highlighted by the headlights of my car. This is another example of adding just that extra other piece, that other variable, that other layer to your composition to make the photo a little bit more interesting. Had I not done that this would be a much more plain looking image. But now we have three variables that are actually kind of interesting here. We have the interesting sky, we have obviously the lead lines with the road, and then we throw in that little bit of highlight light right there from the headlights to round everything out. If I was ranking this out of road images, definitely not that bad. Next up, we have a photo, <laughs> once again, of a damn fence. But this one is better than the last one, and let me explain why. This one, at least we're kind of pointing ourselves towards something. There's something happening with these railroad tracks, where on the last one, it was just like fence, nothingness. At least here, we have fence, kind of something, Still not great though. So the problem with this photo, we have a lot of negative space at the top, be it this overcastness, probably could have cropped it down, probably should have recomposed a little bit lower so there wasn't so much white at the top of this photo. And also something else that could have happened in this image, because we have these train tracks, all I needed to do is wait for a train to come into our photo, you know, maybe give it that extra five minutes. If a train is coming through, I can frame it between one of those fence holes. And then we might actually have three variables here to round out our image. We have the fence, we have the train tracks and then we have the train coming through. Right now it's just still a little bit boring and all that's really going on is the train tracks, um, but this is better than the last example of a fence photo. Now, we have this photo of my car window with the raindrops on it. This is an example of just a photo that looks cool. I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with photos that just look cool when they're in the right context. Say this is in a photo set or an Instagram story or you give it some type of like context, I guess. But when you just show this photo to someone and say, look at this awesome picture I made, you can't help but ask why. Why, why, why? What, what's the point of this photo? There is no point. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't do anything. It's just a mirror with some water on it. Once again, one dimensional. Next up, we have something from the Smoky Mountains here. This ain't too bad. So actually, it's funny. Um, there was a vlog from like a year and a half ago where I tried to go back to this spot and it's been destroyed by wild pigs. I don't really know what happened with all that, um, but I'm definitely bummed because this is an awesome location with these wildflowers. So right here, we have this trail going down the center. Um, one thing off on the left side of the image, this tree right here, I definitely could have gotten rid of this. I probably should have worked around it. All I could have done is take a step forward and and then that'd be fine. So once again, this is an example of a lead line leading us down this image. Everything is great here. We have all the variables we need. We have the grass, we have the flowers, we have these awesome trees going upward. The only thing is this lead line is pointing us towards something and it would have been nice to have something at the end. I was on this trip with some people. All I would have needed to do is say, hey, yo, uh, go stand at the end of this trail for me real quick. I wanna add something else to this photo. And that would have just added that little bit of extra something. By all means, this is not a bad image. This is a great location to find and it wasn't an easy one to get to. Um, so I'm not calling this photo bad at all. It's just, if we're gonna add something to it, it might be nice to add one more element and also get rid of that tree on the left. Next up, we have this waterfall photo. Now this is one of the best waterfall photos from this particular trip because I actually got it right with the layers. So I have a bunch of photos in my Lightroom catalog of this same waterfall where it's just the waterfall. The camera is pointing directly at the waterfall and all it's saying is once again something one dimensional, look at the waterfall. 
that's it. Here though, I added some other composition elements to make the photo a little bit more interesting. Having the rock on the left and the right side of this composition frames up the waterfall and once again gives us another layer of depth. Now it would have been nice to maybe pull the camera back a little bit and get some more water kind of like coming towards the camera creating a third layer of depth to the photo but this is an example of having a one-dimensional image just the waterfall and saying you know I could do something to spice this up and figuring out a composition that works better framing it between these rocks. So next up we have two photos from MLK station here in Atlanta. These are some train photos and once again I can't help but ask with these photos why. They're pretty one-dimensional. Yes, they look cool. They're photos of trains in a train station. They got some cool lines going on. But at this point, I can't help but wonder, what's the point? What are these photos saying? They're not saying anything outside of, hey, these look cool. And I guess that's okay, but they're also one-dimensional. There's literally nothing happening in these photos outside of a train and outside of, oh, cool depth of field train platform with a bunch of lines. Our next example, though, can't lie. If I made this photo today, I'd be completely fine with it. This one is on point. This is from a helicopter. I had the camera out the side of the helicopter, got the helicopter wing in there. The city was perfectly composed. We got a nice gradient sky. Might've been better to have a kind of like interesting sky with some sunset, but in this photo, the gradient works. Everything is balanced out real nice. Uh, if it was just by itself, just the city, it wouldn't be very good. If it was just by itself, the helicopter, it wouldn't be very good. But once again, like I've talked about a bunch today, the helicopter is one element of the photo, a nice foreground to give it some context. Then we have the city looking silhouetted with that little bit of nice sunset light going on. And then we have a very nice backdrop, be it this gradient sky. So this image has our three elements that we want composed very nicely. Everything's balanced. And this one I'm cool with. I like this one. If I made this photo today, I'd be hyped. So next up, we have a photo of the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. And once again, your boy was on trend back in the day with the slight bokeh look to the photo. This was so popular back in the day. Um, the colors on this are nice. Everything looks pretty cool. But once again, we have a lot of negative space going on here. Uh, the objective of the photo is to obviously show the Golden Gate Bridge, but I have so much negative space on the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. All I needed to do here was punch in. I probably could have done this in post with a little bit of a crop. Uh, but right here, it's pretty flagrantly one dimensional. Once again, it's like, hey, Look at the bridge. This one is solid. Three obvious layers composed very nicely. We have the car light trail lines going across the mountain, half of it being orange, half of it being yellow. That looks solid. Then we have this amazing mid ground, be it the city all lit up. And then we have a decent background, be it the lit up sky. It would have been maybe better to have something going on in the sky, but because of the way all the layers are positioned in this photo, there's not too much sky here. If there was like a ton of negative space, it'd be a problem, but it's just a little bit of an extra layer to give the photo that third element, that third layer of depth, but it's not too much. Everything here just balances out nicely. And once again, if I made this photo today, I'd be hyped. Definitely solid. So now we have a photo of the Bay Bridge and this suffers from the same problem that the Golden Gate Bridge suffered, which is you're looking at it and all it is is bang, one dimension, photo over bridge. Literally, that's all it is. Like, hey, look at this photo of this bridge. Everyone makes this photo. You've seen it a million times. Oh, you made it at night, though. That's like the big thing here. Uh, just not enough going on. We have nothing happening in the water aside from the reflection. And then we have this atrociously boring blue sky at the top of the image. I don't know what I could have done to save this. Um, completely recompose it, maybe get somebody in the photo, maybe do something with more layers. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe try to like get lower and get closer to the water. Not sure what I could have done here. It also didn't help that I was using an ultra wide so far away from the bridge. Um, next up, we have some early examples of my product photography. This one's actually solid. Once again, if I made this photo now, I'd be happy. We got some really cool depth of field here. So there's a lot of bokeh. One thing I would do is add some vignette to this photo to kind of draw your eye more into the subject. Uh, this next one of this detail on this Nike shoe, this thing's spot on. I like see nothing wrong with this at all. This looks exactly like a photo I'd make now. This is probably the first night of street photography I ever had that was halfway decent. So in this photo, it's balanced okay. It's actually a kind of decent composition. It shows a little bit of the chaos going on. The problem here is I didn't fill the frame. If you notice on the top left, 
there's nothing happening. It's so boring. It's like just a building with a tower or something, and it really throws off the balance of the image. We do have something interesting on the top right side of the photo, however, be it this sign. And then our foreground is pretty decent too with all these people. It would have just been nice to have another layer to this photo because right now, essentially all we have is foreground, midground, and our background being that disgusting buildings. Something I could have done here to fix this photo is probably move to the right a little bit, use one of these umbrellas as a foreground, so maybe position it in the bottom right or bottom of the photo, and then have all this crowd as the midground, and then have the background being all these signs. So that's it right there. That is me critiquing and reviewing all of my old work. That is 2014. If you want to see 2015, 16, 17, 18, all those, you can go to the thread on my Twitter once again. Check it out there. It's pinned at the top. If you enjoyed the video, hit that thumbs up button, hit that subscribe button if you're not yet. Remember, like I said at the beginning of the video, this is me judging my old work through the lens of what I know about photography now. At the time, making these photos, I thought they were all great, and that's completely fine. That's the process of this. That's how you build. That's how you grow. You always want to try to get better, but you never want to look at your work and beat yourself up and compare it to someone else. I've spent way too much time in my life doing that. It's miserable. It's not something you want to do. Just always try to do your best. Strive to get better. That's how I improve at photography and because I've done that over the years it gives me the luxury to be able to look back on these old works and say yeah, these aren't that good, but at the time they meant something to me. And it's kind of funny looking through all these old photos even though they're not necessarily the greatest compared to now they still all have a really warm place in my heart and they carry so many memories with them and that's part of what photography is all about as well. Yeah, it's cool to get the greatest composition, it's cool to get your exposure right and make everything perfect, but at the end of the day, these images all carry a memory with them. So keep that in mind as well. Don't stop shooting, don't compare yourself to other people, and always try to improve, and photography will always bring value to your life. Thank you guys for watching. Thumbs up, subscribe. See y'all next time.